Okay, well, hello again. It's In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. And tonight I have, or this afternoon, depending where you are in the world, I have Keggy Karu with me, who is a very, um, well, according to the, the stuff written, on the cover lines in the back of her book, um, she is well regarded, you know, in terms of the stuff that you... Uh, elicit out of people in terms of their reaction to your book I mean it's uh it's very good actually so we're going to talk about her latest book which is called Beastly a new history of animals and us and I when I saw that online I saw that on Twitter I thought I must get this lady on even though I know nothing about her I must get her on because the subject sounds so fascinating so um before we go any further I must say that um, this in, in conservation with has been sponsored by CJ Wildlife, uh, as well as Leica Sport Optics. So thank you very much, guys. Um, let me quickly run through what I know about Keggy. Um, and by the way, Keggy, how are you and where are you? I'm very well, and I'm in my um, ancient little cottage in very small cottage in Wiltshire uh, on Chalk. But near a Winterbourne, and it's raining outside. So there we go. I'm in Sounds the like... sorry. I'm in the sitting room because Sounds... I'm closest to the hub here, and it, it's all a bit. You know, we're in a valley, so the, we don't get great signal. So I'm in. I'm nearest the hub. Hopefully that will work out. Okay. Um, one thing I've learned about you, Keggy, in the time that I've sort of first came across you was that you were born in Gibraltar. Does yeah. that make you Spanish or English? Or is that too political? Well, um, it doesn't make me Spanish, although Spanish might like to think it might. But um, my dad was Irish and my passport's Irish. And that's what I quite I would quite like to grab that Irishness for lots of reasons. But I'm a bit of every, I'm, I'm a bit of both. So English, Irish. Um, I don't, haven't stayed in one place very long, but this is probably the longest. I lived in Ireland for quite some you know 10 15 years um, when I the moment I could leave home and um but we're I'm married to a New Zealander and we live in Wiltshire at the moment so there we go so you sound pretty cosmopolitan in terms of your surroundings in terms of people and well I don't know about that I just sort of always I kind of used to run away a lot when I was a kid um <laughs> and uh, I suppose I still you know I've still got that slight sort of inclination to move every now and again I, 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 li I like I've lived in Spain for, for a while and um, New Zealand and Ireland and uh, traveled a bit but you know lately I've been stuck in my shed writing this book. <laughs> why do you why do you think you were running away quite a lot as a, as a youngster? Well I kind of wanted a bit of adventure I mean if you read Dadland which I know you haven't because that's not what we're talking about you that that explains quite a lot uh, my dad was very very charismatic sort of he was a, a spy come guerrilla agent in the war and, and a real sort of wild maverick Irishman and I suppose when I was young I kind of wanted to, to impress him or be my have my own adventures um and home life was pretty difficult for 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 quite a few years and so um you know going off on my own was a kind of response to all that and yeah it it suited me I like that moving thing I like I like moving on okay well dadlan um which you didn't say is uh or you didn't mention this bit which is a great bit it's actually uh, it won the 2016 Costa biography award and was a Times or Sunday Times bestseller. So that's amazing. Yeah, that was lucky. <laughs> it was lucky. Um, it seemed to, it, it, it was a very unusual memoir in that it brought in a whole load of different things together, family, memory, my dad, as my dad was losing his memory to dementia, I was retrieving his extraordinary life and also all the things that sort of, um, shaped his life at an extraordinary time in history um, through the Second World War. But we brought in the Irish, uh, the First World War, my grandfather. So it was all really 
I just kept finding these extraordinary, extraordinary stories. Um, and so it was a sort of book of love, madness, jealousy, war, all sorts of things. And it just seemed to, um, I sort of wrestled with all these things to knit a book together and actually not in a dissimilar way to Beasley. Beasley's, uh, it, it goes off in a lot of different directions. When you're trying to tell the story of animals and us over 40,000 years, and you want to do it in a new way, in a, in a sort of way that will just set it on fire, then you're going to have to go in lots of different directions, which is what happened. And then you've got you've <laughs> you've got this thing where it's actually quite unruly for a long time. And you've got to um, I, I call it a, build, a book building process. But um, that's so that's what. Yeah. Five years of learning and finding the most telling stories about our relationship with with the an animal world. And um, so it wasn't that dissimilar. So Dadland taught me my craft, I suppose. Yeah. Well, Beastly, as you can see here, uh, is just about to see. Yeah, kind of, this, the problem with um, virtual backgrounds is sometimes you can't actually see properly. But there you go, Beastly. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's, it's a book that when I looked at it, it's very rich. And I was saying to Keggy just before we press the record button um, that it's the sort of book that you cannot skim read. You know, you, you read one sentence and you look maybe five or six sentences down and you kind of think, actually, I don't, I need to read the intervening sections, uh, sentences to find out what that sentence is all about. It's a very rich book. And I think as you look at the uh, the cover lines here, everyone's sort of saying how, you know, how passion and sometimes anger or rage and joy, all that sort of stuff's mixed in in the same sentence sometimes. Um, just to quickly give you a rundown on Beastly, um, the official blurb is it throws readers headlong into the mind-blowing glittering pageant of life and goes in search of our most revealing encounters with, animal, with the animal world to show where we've come from and where we're going. What does it mean when a young woman befriends a, a, bo a boar or a gorilla a gorilla tells a joke or a, a fish thinks. Uh, so Beastly is a 400,000 year story, sorry, 40,000 year story of our changing kingship and reframing uh, our un understanding of what is what it's like to be an animal and what our role is as humans. And I'm having problems reading today because I'm not quite focused. But anyway, it's basically, no, sorry? You did a good job. Yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of um, not quite 100% actually, to be honest, but it's 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 a book that, as I said, when I first noticed it online, I thought this is really fascinating, and it's kind of fits in really beautifully with all the stuff we talk about on in conservation with. Um, do you think at this point it's worth kind of just showing us some of the sort of thoughts and images that you wanted to yeah. talk about, so that people can get a sort of feel yeah. for it before we carry yeah, on? Let, let, I just thought I'd start off by just showing the inspiration to this book, how it, you know, how, how, what, all the stuff that was colliding around in my head and how that sort of gelled into a, a, the beginnings of this book. And I thought I'd just show that story a bit. So, so shall I, if yeah. I just share screen, is that yeah. right? Share, share screen, screen, yeah. And I'm sure all you Zoomers know, but once, um, once this is happening, it's best to watch it um, on um, speaker view so you can see the whole screen as opposed to gallery view. Okay, so you you're all see, set. Can you you're see set. that picture? Yeah, we're all set. You're all, can you, you can all see it? Hmm. Okay. So I was sent this photograph of a boar, a huge, a huge boar, and um, a girl uh, in a strange room, the boar on snuffling breadcrumbs on a great big oak table. And then behind the boar, a candelabra was precariously alight. And then behind the girl was a clock on 12 and a whole lot of other clocks and pendulums. And I was just, I was just completely transfixed by this photograph because it was like a spell or like a fairy story or a parable or something. And yet it had this sort of very, um, an inscrutable uh, feeling about it and yet it was very intimate at the same time and it it was like looking through a keyhole 
at a parable or a theatrical stage set. And yet there was something incredibly intimate about the relationship going on. So I, I stared and stared and stared and um, about it sort of stayed in my head bothering me for about two years as I was thinking about I was working about on other things and um, and I was trying to work out at the same time I, I was worrying about the state of the world and the, uh, and the, the sixth extinction and the species the loss of species and how nobody seemed to be doing anything and how there was this whole movement of worry and how what could I do about it and um, I found that, you know, uh, the one thing I could do is tell stories and try, uh, I wanted to work out how we had got to this point. So about two years later, um, in Poland, and this is um, 2019, 2019, the year before lockdown, I found myself eight kilometers down a forest track in Poland in the forest of Bailovesia, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation, I've tried to get that right, but I know it's not quite right. Um, and I was looking in through, I had my face baffled against a window, looking into the, through a window pane in an old forester's hut. And I'm looking at the very room that we're looking at now. It was deserted by the time I got there. Um, but before, so I was, this was, I suppose it was a pilgrimage to discover more. I mean, meantime, before that I had, I'm gonna just go flick into some of the other pictures that I had. Um, now, how do I go? How do I get to the next, ah, oh, here we go. So um, I had found other photographs that equally transfixed me. I mean, here we've got the same girl, the same ball on the bed with a dog, on the arm of a of the woman who's sewing lace is an owl. I just couldn't quite I couldn't quite work anything out. It just seemed the most extraordinary things thing to me. Um, same girl with a raven on her knee um, in the middle of the forest. There's a the track going down down the road. Um, the same girl woman with a band of deer in a in the forest in the snowy forest. Um, and with a fox, I just, you know, I, I've just found, I didn't, I, I needed to um, understand what was going on here and what had happened here. And that is how I found myself there two years later at the very house. Um, and it, it turned out I was meeting um, the niece of, of this person. It turns out that this is Simona Cossack and she wasn't a girl, but she was 27 years old. Um, and it was 1971, the photograph that, that I had originally seen. And um, she, she was a zoologist and she was working for the Forestry Inst Institute studying the um, mammals interrelation, interrelations with their environment um, in the forest. And, she had taken, she'd moved into this lodge, but the lodge was at that point in 1971 divided into two parts, um, two flats. And in the other side was the photographer, the photographer of these photographs, Lech Vilcek. And um, they both couldn't stand each other. Uh, uh, and of course, um, you will have already guessed that, you know, they become life partners and, he brings home this tiny boar and the boar grows into a very big boar, um, 21 years old. And they, they, it's one of those times where everything fleetingly comes together, where two people come together, where the forest animal, they live in harmony with the forest and the animals, they live in harmony, the, the, creatures come and creatures go and it's just one of those very very special very rare times um, that Le Lech caught with his camera Simona wrote about and I was there in 2019 meeting Simona's extraordinarily wonderful uh, niece Joanna and she took me into you know took me into her house and told me all the stories and showed me many many more photographs and 
became the kind of lodestone for me. This book, even though we die and leave Simona and we come back to her quite regularly, because so many stories were um, revealing. So, so many things that she did were revealing and uh, Anyway, so that is basically the inspiration for how I was going to book. So I was going to tell the story, but I was also going to use the emissor emissaries of people who got to read uh, animals and their, um, you know, the way they lived and they got in, lived very, very closely with them. Um, and there were other, I mean, if we go back, you know, I'll just go, here we go, Simona and links that um i think had an injury or had a young in, uh, had a young injury so that their house was like an observational sort of laboratory and a sort of hospital and a home um and the, many of the animals went back into the forest and some just decided to stay um but when i looked when i stepped back from this particular photograph which i do find it an, an extraordinary photograph i i i I, I see it as a parable and I see it as the clock is ticking and time is running out, but we are sharing, you know, our home with the animal world, our sustenance with the animal world, and that it's time that we need to rethink our relationship with the animal world um, before we lose, you know, so much of it. So it, the, the photograph became this parable for me and this sort of lodestone. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. Um, and then I was to go on and find other extraordinary people who have done, ex have done extraordinary zoologists who've done extraordinary re research. I, I can tell a, a wonderful story about Conrad Lorenz watching a fish think. Um, I, I could tell it now, maybe. Shall I tell it now, David? Yeah, let's just have yeah. a story. Okay, so Conrad Lorenz is 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 a um, a zoologist, and from he lived in Austria, and uh, at the turn of the twentieth century, he was famous for you know him, David. He, he was the you know he's the guy that became a mother goose by imprinting his himself on the, these eggs. Um, when they were, you know, and talked to them every day, and then they hatched, and they were, he was the first thing that he, they saw, and they became imprinted, and they became, he became their mama, and they became his family, so that was his sort of famous thing that he did, but he, in his house, his house was also a bit like Simona's house, was just full of creatures, jackdaws lived in the roof, he had, you know, he, nothing was, um, the only thing that was contained was, uh, his aquarium and in his aquarium he had just got these two cichlid fish they are, and they're really really well known for their parenting skills and then this is this is one of the things you know one of these telling stories how we think that fish you know don't have plans and thoughts and all the, set, all the rest of it so uh, this is a lovely story where he um the, the two parents are famous for parenting so that male fish um, cleans a stone, the female fish lays her eggs, uh, they fan the eggs, the fry hatch, and then the father, take, then they swim around and the father sort of escorts them. And then at night, he escorts them back to the little nesty, nest hollow and they um, their swim bladder, they, they, they let the air out of their swim bladders and they sink to the bottom. And one day, um, and then one of the ways that the father brings a little fry back to the nest is by just inhaling them and then he blows them out into the nest while the mother sits, while the mother is in the nest with her fry at night. So one, one day Conrad came back a bit late and all the babies were in the nest, in the, in the nest and the, sick, the mother was in the nest with the babies and the father was sort of, you know, swimming about a bit. And Conrad hadn't fed them, so he'd, he'd chucked in a chopped up earthworm. Now the mother just stayed with the babies and the father just couldn't resist, so he just golloped up the earthworm and he was chewing away. And then one of his babies swam past. Well, his job um, was to swallow the baby and take it home. So he automatically, with a mouthful of worms, swooped on the baby and swallowed the, his own baby. 
And then he stopped and Conrad was watching him just completely riveted. He stopped, uh, he had chewed worm and a live baby in his mouth. And so what was he gonna do? Like he couldn't carry on chewing, otherwise he'd chew his baby. And Conrad Lorenz said at that moment, he, he witnessed a fish think and make a dissimilar. He was, the fish was in a dilemma. The fish thought it through, stopped, and then the next thing, he spat out both the worm and the baby. The baby went to the bottom. Um, the worm he gobbled up again, chewed, finished chewing the, the worm. Then once he'd swallowed the worm, he sucked in the baby, took the baby home to, to, to the mother. And in that moment, it was he said he, he saw a fish think and it you know, makes you, it gives, it gives one pause to think about what, we, you know, we think a fish is thinking and what maybe a fish, fish is actually thinking. And, you know, that there is more going on than we give credit for. And I mean, that's pretty much what I found throughout writing this book, how much more there was and how much, how many mistakes we've made over the centuries. Um, and even now with all this sort of, you know, all, every day we get more sort of information, scientific information, and, and every day it gets ignored. So we're still there. Um, this guy, and this guy, this guy, he's, um, uh, he's Billy Singh, uh, Arjan Singh, and he was from princely Sikh stock. And he was a hunter, game, big game hunter. And one night he was driving home and he, um, caught a leopard in his headlights and he shot it. And he was so re repulsed that he made a pact with himself that he would devote the rest of his life to saving the big cats of India. Um, and this is a wonderful story of, um, he had raised this leopard since um, she was an orphan and ha had returned her to the forest where she'd had, where she had given birth to two cubs and then the monsoon rains just came very very heavily one year and what was on this particular year I think we're 1974 something like that and um so the leopard brought both cubs back to his, his um wooden he called it his tiger haven headquarters um, and put the, the leopard put them in the the cubs in safety in the bedroom and then a week later when the river was down took the carried each one separately by her mouth back to the river but the river was too turbulent and brown and crazy to be able to get across so uh, again you know Arjan could not believe it the, the leopard walked over to his canoe hopped in with her first cub and looked back at him and what could he do but get in the canoe and row her back with her cub then she took the cub into the jungle came back 10 minutes later, he rode the cheetah, I mean, sorry, not the cheetah, the leopard across back. She went and got her second cub and he did exactly the same thing. So again, you know, one of these, these extraordinary um, moments where uh, the relationship between, it's a very strong, intimate relationship that we used to have, you know, in our hunter-gatherer days, possibly much closer relationships with animals than, than we do perhaps now, even though with YouTube and everything, uh, we are seeing more, more extraordinary animal bits of behavior. But anyway, so these, these stories kind of act as a kind of glue to tell the bigger story in Beastly, which is the history of our relationship. So we probably could go out of that, out of the pictures now, if you want. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how to do that. Stop share. Yes, well, I can do it. I've done. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's <coughs> excuse me. I mean, your book, as 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 you said, is a collection really of all these really rich stories. Um, sometimes quite random, it seems, but mm -hmm. it actually all, as you say, kind of blends into this one one sort of statement. Really, are we? Why are we? Why have we? I mean, it's a stupid question, I suppose, or whatever. But why have we lost our kinship with nature? What went wrong? Wow. Um, when did that happen? When did it that, start? You know, that's a huge, huge question, you know, which I spend the whole of the book, 
you know, not necessarily trying to answer. There's never any, you know, definitive answer. I mean, lots of things with our history. Um, what one of the, what, what one thing that I thought was quite interesting was E. O. Wilson, the great, you know, biologist E. O. The late E. O. Wilson. He he looked at our innate nature, I and mean, like any animal, we get we get we we, we get stuck in our ways and he called it the paleolithic curse and it's this innate tension between our our cooperative side and our competitive side so you know as hunter gatherers we were very very competitive and when we started farming and living in these big communities we we you know we had to be very cooperative and, and in fact you know to survive we have to be cooperative as humans, because we're not really kitted out as great animals, you know, we don't have particularly sharp teeth, we're not, we can't run very fast, we don't, we don't have any good hair to speak of, you know, I mean, it's, uh, we need a sort of this, we need all of us to make our, um, our species survive and, and what we've done is, you know, moved into every single niche that we wouldn't necessarily have lived in with, with all that sort of collaborative that, that collaborative brain power but you know we've made it you know we I mean another interesting story so so there's that tension so there's that tension but where we have these two very conflicting strong innate urges competition and cooperation love aggression and and actually that's the wellspring for our poetic power as well um we're very, very creative. It, it, you know, our, our, our tragedy and our and, and our comedy. So, it, you know, it's it's both the wonderful thing about us and also, you know, the curse really, or the Paleolithic curse, as E. O. Wilson called it. Um, but going back to, you know, our history. I mean, we 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 had, you know, before. I mean, Aristotle in three hundred and fifty B.C. You know, he was actually one of the first sort of possible zoologists that was actually that was looking at animals, trying to learn about them by actually observing them in the wild. Um, and he he discovered, you know, he he without microscope, without even knowing that the I think the world was round at that point, he discovered the um, the arm, the sperm, the sperm delivering arm of the octopus. That's a pretty extraordinary thing at 350 BC. And then there was this sort of 2000 year stasis of not actually learning anything else about animals except for using them as like moral ciphers for good and evil and, uh, uh, you know, um, stories of, um, I don't know, fair, not fairy stables, but, you know, fables, religious stories. And it, it our knowledge of animals really was in stasis for a long, long time. I mean, even in, in 1606, uh, I think 1606, or um, Edward Bingley, or uh, Edward, I think it was Ed, Edward Bingley, no, not Edward Bingley, Edward Topsell. Edward Topsell wrote the four, uh, history of four footed beasts. And so 2000 years after Aristotle, uh, he divides the animal kingdom into three categories. This is yeah, 3000 years after somebody's discovered the sperm giving arm. So his three categories are tame and wild. That's one category. Eatable, you know, edible and inedible. That's another cat category. And his third category was useful and useless. And that was where that was how we thought about animals for a long, long, long time. Um, and then, you know, we've been using them for for, you know, we've had our histories, our histories of um, uh, using them as a commodity in one way or other. So, it, you know, it's a long, 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 very, very complicated relationship, which um, the trouble with it is, is that we are in enormous danger not only losing them and what a catastrophe it is losing something that's taken 3.8 billion years to build i mean an extraordinary ca casual thing to allow that to happen 
but it's also going to be extremely harmful and I couldn't understand why people weren't taking more notice about our animal world and we talk about climate change a lot but you know we talk about animals and we call you know the, the word biodiversity I, I I give that a bit of a hard time because I say it sounds like a, a washing powder and it's hard to care about biodiversity because you don't you can't, it doesn't really visually stimulate the imagination about the extraordinary wealth of life that the planet Earth has. Um, so where am I going with that? You can see what this book's going to be, what this book is like, you see, yeah. it's, diverging off. It's interesting, you know, because I, I did read that bit when you talked about that, that, you know, a rhino has taken all these billions of years to to uh, to come to existence as as it is today and also for example the passenger pigeon and they all wiped out in literally seconds compared to the amount of time it took for them to actually be um you know to be what they are and you kind of you know if i was a space person looking down on earth and hopefully haven't done the same thing that i on my planet to what we're doing here i'd be thinking what's wrong with these arrogant uh, creatures you know killing everything that's around them and actually basically um or well, demonizing a lot of yeah well, demonizing there is a, a there is a war on nature yeah it's a war on ourselves as well a war on women war on everything at the moment well actually always but yeah. with the nature thing i mean i you know I, I was horrified looking on twitter the other day and seeing the front page of the daily star that lovely what wonderful newspaper that we have in britain which basically says the feathered scumbags are back oh, no. talking about gulls seagulls actually not even gulls yeah. seagulls um and I, I also told you i just come back from malta and you know some of the people's attitude towards the bird life there and, and you know, i'm sure you know it's been covered a million times but i've never experienced it myself and i just can't understand the the kind of attitude the mentality when when someone kind of says well it's my pastime i can do what i want and they're there basically for me to 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 kill yeah. and it's i just find it so hard to understand that and i i mean the, the question i wanted to ask i mean your, your book is you know it's filled with all these really interesting stories which are very um well researched i mean you, you talk about facts as you actually tell the story so you might say the j did you know he actually eats x amount of acorns but anyway the story is you know so you 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 kind of inform as well as tell the story is storytelling something that is relevant in today's age do you think that not only have we, have we lost touch with nature but we've actually lost touch with ourselves in terms of how we were in the past it's, you know talking about stories and then spreading the stories around our communities is, is that kind of is that going I don't think it'll ever go because I think we are, you know, we, we are storytellers and we've always been storytellers or as long as I can see. Certainly, I mean, I started the story when we were in the caves painting, you know, the pictures of animals. Um, George Monbiot recently said he's sick of stories. He wants facts and figures. And I absolutely get that, too. You know, we need some facts and figures to move on. But if I think about most people most people are very busy and they don't have you know they're trying to feed their families to go to work do all the rest of it and that you know they can't really be expected to wade through a whole lot of academic papers with facts and figures and so my i felt my job was to try and tell the story the big story in 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 a way where it was it did have those facts and figures as you said you know the j you know planting the the oaks that sailed the seas and and, and the rest of it um are we losing are we losing the story i think possibly a little bit yeah i mean i'm at a different i'm the generation that's not quite so sort of tech happy you know i'm not i don't live on my phone i read books um my attention span i've always i've always i've always been a bit of a daydreamer but i yeah i'm a book reader whereas i'm not sure that so many young people read like like i do or maybe they do but i you know there, there's this phone flicking um swiping that's that's quite hard to keep people's attention 
but um you know i mean there are some fantastically brilliant young people you know and some fantastic new eco young ecologists and we teach we've got this little um nature reserve which my husband jonathan runs and he teaches young people about nature and he does the john muir award with them and they're really really astonishing um young people coming up and uh you just so want you just so want uh, a beautiful world for them you know i mean the, this this idea about growth actually that's the other thing about this but there's lots of sort of um you know strong feelings about how how things go like growth there's all this talk about growth and everybody's sort of saying the most important thing is uh, economic growth and you know what we want is growth of courage growth of care growth of some decent proper jobs that actually you know are meaningful um instead of the sort of pent up consumerism thing it's it just you know we we need a whole new load of new systems and a new paradigm to live by i think and i hope i hope that that will be the case and there are lots and lots of fantastic things happening so there's lots of new stories coming out you know so um and lots of yeah lots of good stories i mean one of my favorite actually uh, uh, my favorite it's not my favorite but one of the stories it's quite a short one that i think is a really inspirational one is the one of the galapagos tortoises that were down to 15 in 1960 on espanola island and they were like 140,000 feral goats just munching through the habitat and somebody decided they were going to do something about this they took the 15 adult individual giant tortoises off the island to and put them in a breeding center and they eradicated the goats and that's another long story that's not another story which i won't go into right now but they took the 15 adults and for 55 years they conducted this breeding program with these giant tortoises and have eradicated the goats and so I think it was 2,300 giant tortoises now from these 15 are back in Espanola. But the beautiful, beautiful thing about this story is that in 2020, I think it was 2020, the original 15 tortoises, because of course they're really long living, were taken back to Espanola out of the breeding center and they were carried on the backs of 15 humans like great big stone age coracles so like they were like backpack into the interior of espanola island and let free to live out the rest of their long lives with the whole of their family that they had single-handedly well 15-handedly saved um through in the last 55 years by this breeding program i mean I, for me that's a beautiful beautiful thing so that's like that's a new story and so that's what I wanted to do is sort of get some new stories out and try and understand some of the old stories and unravel the bigger story um, and then learn all about it too because you know this has been a, learn, a huge learning thing for me um, to really understand how 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 nature functions I didn't you know i mean and i know how it functions now although nobody of course knows how it, how it functions but i understand things like trophic cascade and you know um how keystone species affect from top up and top down and um how how you know we we're pretty much sort of taking apart this world rivet by rivet and you just don't know which is the rivet that's going to make everything collapse because there's 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 usually one that's you know the pickup sticks that makes the whole thing collapse so. yeah it's like it's like um you know trying to clip the wires of a bomb or something you know you don't know which one you're going to be yeah cutting yeah. do you think that the okay storytelling has an important role to play but do you think that we need to kind of change how we tell stories now because obviously we live in an age of social media as you said earlier i mean i've got a gripe with and i've always said this on previous in conservation with but you obviously haven't seen this but my grab is how nature is sold to us i hate i'm beginning to hate the way it's sold to us actually now because it's all about it's over there somewhere and it's it looks okay you know so yeah. if you as a viewer you're just looking at it as entertainment and basically you don't have to do anything just sit back and 
and drawing the figures on their thing, on their sheets to show that the show's been successful. But social media, I mean, I I think that stories should be told there too, even if it's only in 180 characters. Um, and a lot of people, uh, you know, I speak to don't really understand that because I think of any story, whether it be a book or, you know, a tweet, it, it should really have a beginning, middle and end. It should also have something to draw you in and, and teach you. Um, so what do you think about that? Do you think that um, to engage with the new kind of people coming through now, we need to kind of retune how we tell these stories. I mean, the stories you've told tonight have been absolutely really riveting and interesting. And I mean, you know, I'm looking forward to actually sitting down and reading your book properly. Um, but do you think we need to kind of think of a, another way of doing it? Does it need to be a bit more condensed, a bit more truncated? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, when I know what grabs me and I've always had a very, very low threshold of boredom. I've always been distracted, he's very easily distracted. So I know what's really, I think I know what's really interesting. And I have an absolute horror of boring anybody. So I like fast paced stuff. Um, and I like, I like digging deep as well. I like, you know, proper detail and proper. So all I can really do is do what I like <laughs> and give people what I like. And I think that we're quite, I think most people are quite similar in a way. I think we, we're all individuals, of course, but I also think that we do have the sort of, you know, we get gripped by the same thing and we, our attention is held by the same thing. And I couldn't agree more. I'm a, a beginning and a middle and an end person, even though I like lots of diversions sometimes down the way. And I like, I'm really, I'm, I am really interested in psycholo the psychology of how we work. And I, I'm very, very interested in the gray areas and not, you know, one thing or the other. I, it never is one thing or the other. It's always very, very complicated. So I've tried to understand, you know, what, why hunters hunt and why, um, you know, some people are very, very close to animal, their animal um, kin and others uh, find that much more they're, they're much more distant and so there's lot there's just questions all the way through but as far as a, a way of telling stories I mean maybe there is maybe it needs to be you know a faster grab in and out I don't know but that's not I write books so it, I would perhaps I'm actually thinking of maybe I should get this book into a sort of children's book um the the brilliant brilliant Helen Scales uh, has just written this um, with illust illustrators, this book called, um, I think it's Scientists in the Galapagos. And it's just, she's a brilliant marine biologist who, who writes about our oceans. Um, and she's just done a kid's book. And I think that that may be her answer to your question that um, she's finding a different way to, to, to talk to different types of people. And so she's made up these scientists and they get they get to go to the Galapagos and it's it's, it's beautifully illustrated and it's um, yeah maybe that's the way forward. In your book talking about social media I understand that you um, also have a little section on our good friend Elon Musk. <laughs> you, uh, can you kind of bring this into how he appears in your book? Oh well he appears in my book I should have actually I, I, yeah the thing, he appears in my book in a bit of a rant about you know um his idea of, of you know leaving the sinking ship and going off to mars and you know all his sort of tech guys and he sort of set up this moon station and for refueling and it's going to take i don't know how, how long to get there and and it's as if he hasn't really looked at mars and how could you possibly think of going to mars when you leave this beautiful planet and um you know, it's a, it's just a rant about him and he's and, and all the um, satellites he's going to put up that are going to screw up my, the 
um, migratory birds, stars and uh, system and stuff like that. So it was a bit of a rant about Elon Musk and another guy who was going to duplicate soil on Mars. And you think, well, why can't you duplicate soil on Earth? Because, you know, that's another thing. We're losing hand over fist. Um, but, you know, when you look about, when you think about an, an animal like, an animal. I mean, what could be more alien? Because, yeah, Elon Musk likes Mars because it's so much more out there, right? That's quote, so much more out there. But you know, how could you how could you match an animal that can squirt ink at you, that can change colour, that can uh, turn into sort of this rainbow, that can uh, grow horns and warts and mimic? Uh, camouflage itself with its surroundings that can uh, gesticulate with eight limbs that can lose a limb and grow another one that can um, you know a million things that an octopus or a cephalod can, can do I mean how could you possibly want how could an alien match something like a, a, a cephalopod or a butterfly you know kaleidoscopic velvet wings with a long proboscis that that makes flowers grow i mean you know the idea of, of leaving this beautiful 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 planet and going off to mars and i actually say all oh, good i'm glad they're going off to mars <laughs> good <laughs> yeah fair yeah. enough <clears throat> um i guess this is a question that should be right at the very end but are you opt optimistic i am sometimes and sometimes i'm not if i'm absolutely honest sometimes i despair but because we have a nature reserve, you know, because we were lucky, we were lucky that we could, we wanted to do something. And so we found 20 acres and we, you know, have had that for 10 years. So when we, when I'm there and when I see what Jonathan is doing with these young kids and all the nature that has come back to this piece of land, it just is mind blowingly um, wonderful. And when we start mixing more, with other people who are really trying to do do stuff for nature that fill, that fills me with hope and i think that's the only all you can do is all you can do you know and i think when i'm in that frame of right mind i'm in you know in a good place and there are a lot of people and more and more and more people are doing stuff in their own particular way and you know it's not too late it's not too late to not we can never get what we've lost back but it's not too late to fix a lot of the problems that we've got and if one of the, one of my big bugbears in this book is the fact that animals get so sidelined in history you know we forget about them all the time we talk about climate change and actually animals are the thing that could so help our situation creating healthy dynamic ecosystems again whales in the ocean uh, you know, they're the gardeners of the of the whole marine web, the whale pump, you know, they're 50 tonnes of iron they defecate into the top layer that fertilises the phytoplankton that sucks out the CO2 and gives us all half our oxygen. And then, you know, they when their bodies sink to the o ocean bottom, that's 33 tonnes of carbon just in one whale. So what on earth is the value of a great big le 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 leviathan and her 10 calves and their 10 calves over a 90 year lifespan. It is just huge. And yet still, still, we are wailing. Also, the Russians are wailing and, and still um, Norway. Norway is suddenly ki killing all their wolves when we know exactly how incredibly important they are to the ecosystems. And how, you know, I mean, rewilding is getting knocked all the time. And yet this is a fantastically free fix in unproductive, uh, not agricultural land that will help sort out our, you know, our, our um, pollution problems, our flooding problems, our pollinating problems that, you know, they're all going to come crashing in. And so there are a lot of fantastic fixes that are run by animals for free because they know what they're doing and it's there these systems are so incredibly complicated and technology will have its place but you know we we keep forgetting that actually 
we are surrounded by our saviors if only we would let them you know get on with it and if only we gave them room to yeah it brings us back to what we started with at the beginning of this conversation the fact that you know looking down on us we're we're quite arrogant and you know we demean animals i mean i find it you know i'm i try to be positive all the time in my message but sometimes you know i've i it's i find it hard you know i mean i as i said i was on malta but being on malta made me realize that actually it's not just malta it's the uk it's you know the whole of the mediterranean it's even like the week before i was in tobago it's even in places like there there's trapping going on there's people killing um wildlife for bushmeat wildlife that now for example there's an armadillo on uh, tobago a small tiny arm- armadillo which is really rare now and is a carrier of leprosy yet people track it down kill it and eat it on festivals why you know and it's and they, and they know it's becoming more rare mm. but they still mm. you know track it down the same you know eagerness to try and to, to try and kill them to eat them so i, I despair sometimes because i find it very difficult sometimes you know to to keep going um if i'm honest um especially when you actually go to the cold face and see these people doing it you know i went to a party in tobago because there was a, sort of a night where they had loads of parties and there was one party where they actually were you know cooking um bush meat and were trying to offer me you know some lizard or something and i just couldn't do it no i mean that goes back to education again and it goes back to you know our belief systems are very very fixed you know humans we're like other animals are quite fixed too in their ways and so are we and we are arrogant we've always been you know but then again you know we are an extraordinary animal and we've got tools that are way beyond our own capacity so it's our tools you know that our collaborative tools that that we do all the damage with um education and i mean at the end of the book when you get there <laughs> is a section called golden joinery and i've taken the metaphor from that japanese uh, method of kintsugi which is mendri- mending broken pottery and they mend it they they use the fracture sites as a as a as a as a they, they actually fix it stronger and more beautiful. So you've got these golden se- seams all the way around a pot and they don't hide the breakages. And I use that as, as my metaphor for what, what we slowly are beginning to do in the, on the planet with some of the areas that we're safeguarding um, as like green joinery where we're, um, some of the some of these military zones that were left like the north korea demilitarized zone that the um there's a whole load of um uh, even where the iron curtain was is now an interconnected green belt with 24 countries um and there you know things are growing in that way um animals are coming back i mean when i was a kid there were no bear, bear there was one bear in the alps probably and that was some poor thing half yeah so we've now got bears and wolves and wild boar and we never used to have that in europe and we you know we were letting the wild back in not here in this country we've got medieval fear prevails here but there it's things are coming back so you know we, I try, not always succeed, but I do try and concentrate on what we can do and education and, oh yeah. So I was quite interested in well, something on the radio recently and they were saying, somebody said that you need 25% to change for social change. So if you can get 25% of the population to suddenly start, then that, that triggers political change. So you don't need, you know, 50%. So my thing was, right, okay, so that's 25% of the population to learn about our relationship with the natural world. And so beastly is my effort. And it, oh, there was a lot of, there was a lot of sweat and tears, let me tell you, let me tell you. My husband is doing his, his, um, nature reserve and the john muir award with the young people you're doing your incredible work i mean in uh, just 
you know, sharing your knowledge and sharing the excitement of, 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 of wild things. And I don't know, sometimes, I, sometimes I'm really, really optimistic about that and other times I'm not, but you know. Peggy, briefly, what's your favorite life form? Okay, I'm gonna cheat on this one because that's my nature. <laughs> I've got two, I've got two answers. I'm going to go, I, I'm sure you've heard this before, but the wolf, I'm inordinately fond of the wolf uh, for so many of its beautiful characteristics, its cleverness, its par parenting skills, its, um, you know, its ecological value, um, the fact that it's, and my empathy for its persecution for pretty much all our cultural history, <laughs> we have persecuted the wolf, you know, the, the wolf, uh, will eat not only our sheep but our grandmothers and so I'm going to go with the wolf but I'm also going to go with a whole bush full of sparrows because I absolutely love them we had almost lost our bush of sparrows we were down to the last two and um, this was I think in oh, eight years ago and um, I read up everything about sparrows. We put a whole load of roosting ledges for them. And I started feeding them mealworms when they were feeding their chicks. We were literally down to the last two. And those two had, I think, eight or nine fledged sparrows that year. And then maybe some other local ones came in. But I've now, I've now got a flock of 40. And I don't mean to say that they're mine because I don't own the sparrows. But... Um, so much joy from those from a whole bush but you have to have a whole book of sparrows you can't just have two well so. two great choices and two choices that have never been chosen before so, oh really absolutely oh, yeah. um and if you could be anywhere in the world where would you be okay like? so where i would be is in northern alberta mm. ho hovering over the greatest beaver dam in the world that's half a mile long and nobody, no humans can get to it, which just makes me laugh. And that's actually when I get when I get down, I go and look at these Google images of this of this beaver dam. And it was discovered by this Frenchman who was looking into permafrost and he could suddenly see, you know, this um, extraordinary gash in this um, wetland, forest wetland area. And then the BBC rang up um, Buffalo, it's, it's in Buffalo Wood National Park, Wood Buffalo National Park, and they didn't, they didn't know it was there. And they flew a flight plane over it. They couldn't land because the water, it was too shallow. And then they couldn't wade in because the, the wetlands were just too, went on for, for too far so that humans couldn't get in there. So that is the place that beavers get on and do their thing without us and that we don't even, we're not even tourists there. So I would just hover over that that dam and invisibly, that's where I'd be. That's another great choice, Keggy. Um, Zoomers, just to let you know, we've got two more in conservations with coming up for this season. One this Thursday with Nick Aitchison, who will be talking about his book, uh, It's Cycling in Search of Geese. Um, and Lev Parakian, uh, Parakian is going to be around again um, talking about his book which is about flying about flight it's actually called flights of fancy I think but it's actually about um, flying animals and why they fly and how they fly so that could be an interesting one as well so it's just two more to go and then the end of the season and we start again hopefully in October this year. Keggy I'd like to thank you for sparing your time to talk to us about your fantastic book which I advise everyone to read but sit down and read it properly because it's if you miss a couple of words you're going to be missing stuff so you've got to read every word um <laughs> well done with the book and I wish you all success with this thank you very much Keggy thank you David that was really lovely and thank you for inviting me oh my pleasure and um Zoomers thank you very much for being here again I uh, hope to see you again um in the near future but until that happens, don't forget, keep looking up. <laughs>